Trusting with Kerry Jones. Hi guys, and welcome to this week's podcast. This week's guest originally comes from Northern Ireland, but now lives in Waterford and is a guide on the River Blackwater. She also runs hosted trips to Iceland, Greenland and Patagonia. She is a qualified upguy cast instructor and is often seen demonstrating her skills at fly fishing shows around the world. She has an amazing story to tell how she got into making a living from a passion of fly fishing. Welcome to my chat with Glenda Powell. Thanks for joining me, Glenda. Thank you, Kerry. It's really nice to be part of this podcast. It's been on the cards for a while, meaning to call you. And in fact, I saw you at last year's BFFA briefly, but it was one of those things that show you, it's just, your head's everywhere, isn't it? Well, especially if you're involved in doing something at a show, Kerry, it's one of those things that, you know, I always always say when we do shows like this, there's the only thing you really see is your own stand, what you're doing yourself, and um, and you see very little of anything else, really, you know? Yeah. So I keep promising myself I'm going to go to some shows and just be someone who, you know, pays in at the door so I can go and see everything that's going on. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it's been hard. I mean, it's hard to get me as well, Kerry, because I'm traveling a lot as well. So, yeah, I know I've been looking forward to talking to you for quite a while also. Have you been out this year yet? Well, in fact, I do know the answer to that because I saw a photograph you were on the... Um, the opening day of the Finn, was it? Yes, um, it's been a busy start to the season so far. So we started, we had a, um, a cadence open day on um, Kerrysville Fishery here in Ireland, yeah. in Blackwater. And um, and then we had our own opening day on the Blackwater. Um, and then immediately after, I headed up to the River Dee um, to do an opening day up there in Scotland and then back. And the last opening day I was at was on the River Finn. And um, that was, it was a fantastic, a fantastic day out for people. And I love how they do the ceremony as well with the, with the bagpipes and, yeah. and everyone just getting together. And I love that whole tradition of blessing the river. We also do it on the Blackwater and have done for years, you know, so it's just very nice to mark the opening of the season and, and, um, and to remember people that have been with us before, but are no longer with us. And I think it's really important yeah. um, to, you know, to mark the people that have gone on before us and, you know, for to remember them on day special days like that, yeah. Yeah, and I think opening day, um, even on the lakes, I did an opening day here on the, on Friday, March the 1st is one particular lake. And it's not about catching fish, is it, on opening day? It's just getting no. together after the winter and just seeing people you haven't seen for, you know, months. And you just remember each past opening day, we did this, we did that. It's just a nice thing to do, and it's nice to have a toast of whiskey, maybe. Yeah, it is, and I, I think I think you're right. I think it's um, it's one of those days where most of us don't really even wet a line. It's just the whole day is a bit like Christmas Day um, for anglers, where we've been waiting for this day for a long time, and um, and suddenly we're off again and into another spring. And I think spring is a very important time for 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 all of us, especially anglers, when we know that. You know, it's going to be really quiet at the beginning of the season, but it builds up fish-wise and, and the temperature builds and everyone just feels a little bit better when they can get back onto the river again after, you know, kind of being locked up a little bit during the winter time. So it's a very, very precious day. Yeah. Um, and we I certainly love I love attending them if I can. And the Blackwater's been open a month already then. Was it first of Feb that opened? Yeah, we opened on the 1st of February. We closed on the 30th of September. And um, it's usually quite quiet with fish uh, the whole of February. Um, there was a fish caught there on Sunday. Um, I think it was the first fish in the Blackwater that's been recorded. But, I mean, that's, that's become normal for us um, to, to understand that, you know. And we go out there, we practice our casting, and we run several casting courses and stuff at the beginning of the year as well for people who want to, you know, tune up after winter and hone their skills, or even for beginners who want to get going before the season starts properly. Yeah. So I'd be very busy teaching at that time of the year. I know you're busy by looking at uh, your Facebook page, but so I appreciate you talking to me now because I, I guess you're busy packing. Is it right I, you're going to pa- Patagonia soon? 
Yeah, it's funny that you say that because I have this long list of to do's, um, which um, <laughs> I, I, I don't live without, you know, but when I got to the beginning of this week, um, I, I wrote this to do list and I thought, oh, my good grief, I'm never going to manage to get to the end of this before I do fly out to Patagonia next Monday. Um but anyway, we're getting through it. So, so I have, um, yeah. So I, I'm flying to Patagonia next Monday, and um, and I have a group of twelve people coming with me, and uh, and there are people from all over the world. So I have s- several Americans coming down with me that come down every year with me. Um, I have a few Irish people coming out, which is also great. And some of them are new people who've never been down to Patagonia before. I have a couple of Scottish people coming, some English people coming, and some people from from Sweden. So, so it's a very mixed group, and I think that's wonderful about doing trips as well. That you know we have a mixed group of people, you know, diverse backgrounds and and personalities, and yeah. you know, all meet together through fishing. And a lot of us will be travelling together and um, and and heading down. But it's just you know, fishing is the theme, and um, but we're all just excited about being able to go out to such a, a wild, remote place. And how long are you going for? So, and, okay, so normally I go for two weeks. So I will be out there for for approximately two weeks. Um, the clients come out for um, for a week at a time, mostly, and um, but I normally stay out a little bit longer because usually I will run two groups, and the second group will join me then in Patagonia when I'm there, and I'll fly home with them. Um, so yeah, I, I head down every March, and and Kerry, it's really funny because. Um, I always do St. Patrick's Day um, in Las Piteras Lodge in Patagonia, which is unusual because, you know, everyone's celebrating here at home. But yeah. I will bring the flags with me and, you know, I've got little table decorations and I'll get up dead early in St. Patrick's Day and decorate the lodge with balloons and, and everything. And and it's it's really interesting. It's, it's nice. It's nice. So I've got used to doing um, St. Patrick's Day in Patagonia each year. Right. i I actually been uh, a couple of times in Ireland for St. Patrick's Day and only yeah. once I've spent it in Temple Bar never again yes. it was carnage no, no. but um, I, I love you know the whole St. Patrick's Day thing even in Cardiff yeah it's a big thing I think too I think most anglers would prefer to be spending St. Patrick's Day on a river somewhere and, and yeah. quite often a lot of the rivers um, will open on St. Patrick's Day here in Ireland and, and a lot of the anglers will be out celebrating the fishing as opposed to celebrating the whole event Patrick's Day yeah. so, so how, how how many years have you done the, the trip to Patagonia? Kerry I go to I've been to Patagonia my first year was 2010 um, so so I've been going down there doing hosted trips since that time and um very blessed to be able to see such a beautiful beautiful part of the world um and yeah it is a, it is a long way um to get there and i think that puts some people off but i think honestly i'd probably sit on the floor of the airplane to go um it's just such a special place when you get there you know i just it's very difficult to um to try and and, and tell people what it, what it's like yes one of the windiest places on earth and again, that puts some people off, but we use the wind to help us to cast when we're there. So it's not so bad that you won't be able to cast or catch fish or, you know, and, and there's just, even though when, when you get, get, when you finally arrive to a place called Rio Gagos, which is a little airport and a town um, in South America, when you get there, you know, and you drive the 40, the 40 kilometers um, to the lodge, there's very little to see. It's just like arriving onto the moon. You have very much desert land and in the, I remember the first time I went there it was like oh my goodness you know we live in a beautiful country in Ireland and of course Wales is too and um, and we're, we're very used to seeing green grass and you know lush trees and um, and it's different it's just different because it's it looks so barren and then you get into the lodge and um, which is a very beautiful accommodation and it's a very nice place to stay but when you get onto the river Again, for the first day, you think it's just a barren like landscape until you start to see all the little plants growing and um, and the tiny little bushes. And, and then you have so much wildlife to look at. You know, there's birds just everywhere, all different types of ducks and, um, and you know, condors flying overhead and pink flamingos flying past. And, really? And you just, you know, it's just an amazing scene. And then you have these wild foxes you have um, rhea, um, which are like ostrich type birds. Um, they're just, you know, ground birds that they don't fly and they're running around everywhere. 
you have um, little camels and, you know, there's all sorts of things going on whenever you're fishing. So you never, ever get bored. I mean, you could just stand there and look at the wildlife. There's armadillos, there's skunk. There's the very, very rare occasion where somebody um, would see a puma, which is, I haven't seen one in all those years. I've only seen a photograph of one. But, you know, there's kind of, there's just everything, you know, that, yeah. that, that is just different from here. Well, I'm not saying it's better because I think Ireland's one of the best places to go fishing on earth. But I mean, I do think that I like to go to different places because it's wild. And that's just yeah. one place I go, Kerry. Well, I also do Green Greenland. Um, I do Iceland. Um, you know, so I, 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 I get to see some the most amazing um, places and landscapes. And I suppose the more remote it is for me, sometimes the better it is. That's what I love as well, the remoteness. Mm. I've had a, a couple of opportunities and invitations to go, and I, I've never actually gone. But there's, apart from the fishing, which I've heard is really good, another reason I'd like to go, there's a lot of Welsh communities there, isn't it? And yes. there's Welsh speaking. Because my yes. first language is Welsh. I'd love to be able to go there and talk to somebody from or the other side of the world almost, I guess your native language wouldn't that be amazing wouldn't yeah it? so maybe yeah. it's on the cards on the list of uh, yeah. places to go i'm not a lover of flying to be honest i've done it through necessity but i think for that distance it'd have to knock me out i think but i mean of course i mean when you're going on a fishing trip like that i think you'd probably get over it <laughs> is the sea <laughs> is, it, is the sea trout you're fishing for or or salmon yeah so um, no, it's sea trout. It's a it's um it's a place where they have the largest sea trout in the world, and again, like like the um the scenery, it's very hard to describe the fish because there are many fish. I'm not going to say that people are going to catch many many fish when they go there because that would be giving a false impression, and it's something that I'm really careful of when I'm when I'm trying to promote trips. I like to give people a very realistic view. Um, of how it is and how how it can be because you see people pay a lot of money obviously to go yeah. um, with me to different places and you know when I can measure their expectations and they have a real expectation of going somewhere then that's so so important so yes we do catch big sea trout most people who go out there will catch sea trout um, I had one occasion many many years ago where one person did not catch a fish but that was a long, long time ago, and it's never happened since. And again, only one person out of all of the people I've taken down there. He's playing golf um, now, is he? <laughs> <laughs> I really hope, you know, I really hope that that person did go back. They didn't, they didn't go, you know. They, it, it, in fact, the person wasn't even part of my group. It was just somebody else that was in the lodge. Yeah. And I spent um, quite a bit of time trying to get this person to fish, but it just wasn't going to happen for him. But, um, but that's rare, so rare. And in fact... There are times where I have taken down complete beginners and they have caught many fish. Yeah. And um, we had a complete beginner who caught the biggest fish one year as well. So it doesn't, you know, just because we're going somewhere like really foreign doesn't mean that you have to be like a really exceptional fly fishing person no. to be able to enjoy it and also catch fish. It does help a bit um, if you can cast before you go there. And I would always be running you know, my groups and trying to get them, you know, their casting up to scratch, et cetera, before we do head out and yeah. and making sure they have the correct tackle and lines that are suitable for the wind and, you know, that they're able to use them. So I've you know, noticed I more and more yeah. every year people are going this season. I've known number, I've known personally probably about six or seven people, which has uh, gone there and, you know, they, they've all had fish. It's a special place. Yeah. All right. It is a special place. Again, it's one of the it's one of those last really remote places left, and um, and I suppose that's why I like Greenland as well. But Patagonia, it may be remote, but there are hospitals. I mean, like it's only forty forty um, kilometers to the nearest town, which has great hospital facilities and um, and has dentistries if anybody needs an emergency. You know, so yeah. it's still it's wild, but you still have civilization. Whereas right. Greenland. That's totally different um, in that we are like two and a half hours by boat to the nearest um, to the nearest village. And in Greenland, there are no connecting roads between the villages. So it's flying or, or you know, taking boats. So that is a, a completely different experience where there is no Wi-Fi. There are no yeah. phones. I tell you a place I'm going to in July. Uh, possibly you've been there. I don't know. I'm going to the Pharaohs. No, I have not been there. 
I've it's, not. it's been on my bucket list for years. And there's um, a, a lady angler, she actually lives in Germany, Marisha Kirchner. And she's a big fisherwoman, you know, and she loves the fly fishing. And she actually lived in Connemara for a couple of years. And then mm-hmm. she discovered then the pharaohs. And she just, she's got a, a property there. So basically six months of the year she's in Germany and six months of the year she's in the pharaohs. So oh, amazing. Yeah. yeah, so I'm looking forward to it. And if there's anything like Connemara, that's that's me. I'm sold on it, you know. That yes. to me is, that's what it's all about, the wildness of it, you know. It's it's a hard place to leave. I love the place. We run trips to Connemara. In fact, we've got a, a trip going to Connemara in April to Delphi, um, the Bundoraha River and, and the locks. Yeah. So I, I run a little hosted trip out there as well for a couple of days. And I do that a couple of times a year. So again, it's a great, it's a great place. It's a beautiful, yeah, um, wild, another wild place. It's near one of the places, one of my favourite places on earth, and that's Linan. And, yes. Oh, it's just like when you're in Linan, it's sort of like you take a deep breath. It's like I'm here. It, it's such a, I don't know, calming place. And it's even if it's tipping down with rain, hammering mm-hmm. down, you just feel at home there. You know. You were saying about the Delphi. Obviously, you have got the Delphi Lodge. There was a. There's a spa there. I went once. I don't know if it's still there. No, it looked quite. Is it a, the Delphi Resort Center? I have not been there. It could be, um, but it was a long time ago. But when I went there, one thing which caught my eye in the like the the foyer area, they had a miniature boat, and it was like a clinker boat, proper Irish clinker boat, a loch boat. But it was like a quarter or a third of the size. It was a coffee table. And it was a work of art. And I thought, I want one. I've got to get one of these. And I left. A couple of months later, I phoned them. And I asked them. And they said, it's not there, no. And they had new owners. So, And they didn't know what I was talking about. I was gutted. But it's like, Mm -hmm. it was something special. That's my memories of Delphi. But um, I've never fished it. Um, So going back to the beginning, how did it all start? What age did you pick up your first rod then? Yeah, Kerry, I was nine. My uncle Michael um, died and left me his fishing rods. And unfortunately, he didn't have time to teach me how to use them. And he knew he was going to pass away. And and I, the only thing I can think of is that he, he was a great fly tire. And I can remember sitting, watching him tying flies. And I was absolutely intrigued. I suppose as a little girl with all of these pieces of feather and fluff and fur and tinsel. And, and um, I remember the old Labrador lying below the table. And, and of course, I was just sitting there watching my my uncle tie these um, these little intricate patterns. I had no idea really what they were for or anything else. He did try and describe to me, but he obviously knew I had some interest in fishing. And so whenever he passed away, my aunt Liz gave me his fishing rods. And uh, so it was one of those things that, yeah, you know, I was given I was given these beautiful rods. They were split cane, and you know, back back in the day, when you, you think about it now, I, I think I was 11 before I got my first um, carbon fiber fly rod. And I remember that experience very well too. My father taking me to Trevor West's shop in a place called Cumber in Northern Ireland, um, where I'm from, and uh, going in there for my 11th birthday and picking out this fantastic uh, nine foot Daiwa, you know, carbon fiber rod. And uh, this was a really big deal. But um, but before school, after school, quite often when I should have been in school, off I went fishing, and um, and I just learned from the old people in the riverbank that give me a fly, that you know teach me a little bit about how to cast, and you know help me get unstuck from trees. And those were the days where you could actually take off, carry in, but you know by yourself as yeah. a kid and down the little river. And and I had my sisters with me at times as well. But of course I met friends on the river, and that's what fishing's all about, isn't it? Yeah. But it, that was really how it got going, and. And then, you know, you get to a certain stage where you have to make choices in life. And I was working in food factories and and um, and I was I was very young, I was 14, 15, working in food factories and was destined to be doing something like that for the rest of my life, I suppose, from where I came from. And I remember my father bringing back a book from work and he and he gave it to me as I was the only kind of reader in the family at that time. And he says, again, this book's no use to me. You, you might get some use out of it. And uh, the book was called The Success System That Never Fails, and it was written by a guy called William Stone. And this book was one of those, um, it's kind of like a self-help book. It was a, you know, written way back in the, in the 1940s or something. And, um, and it was about what the mind can believe 
and conceive the mind can achieve, you know? Yeah. So as a 14 year old reading this book and rereading it and rereading it, it's probably one of the only books we had in the house apart from the Bible. And, um, and I remember reading it and thinking at a 14, as a 14 year old, I truly believed <laughs> Kerry, I look back now. I mean, yeah. it was a fantastic book. So I truly believed I could do anything that I wanted to do. If I just set my mind to it and worked really, really hard at doing it, that I would be able to achieve it. Yeah. And what a gift to have as a such a young person. Because I was there working in my factory and doing my 12 hour shifts. And, you know, I was going, I'm not doing this for the rest of my life. I'm not doing this for the rest of my life. I'm, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to do something different. And and I suppose at 18, when, you know, there was a, a position come up um, that I didn't particularly want to take, um, I decided I was going to take off to Scotland and told my parents I was going fishing for the rest of my life. So at 18 years old and two months, yeah, I know, I'm not joking. At 18 years old and two months, I took off to Scotland. I had a thousand pounds, which I saved up working in fish and chip shops and factories. And and I was also working on a, on a rainbow trout fishery called Loch Cooey down in Port Ferry um, every Saturday and Sunday. And I decided I was going to go fishing and to teach people how to fish for the rest of my life. And I arrived into Scotland um, with a thousand pounds in a little car. And I stopped in a place called Air. Yeah. And I asked the lady there where the most jobs were going. And she goes, go to Aberdeen, big granite city. There was lots of oil. It was 1993. And um, and I drove to Aberdeen the next day, came across this massive city. Of course, there was no Google or anything else. I had no, you know, I, I had no idea what it, what Aberdeen was look, looked like. So you didn't plan and, it. You just uh, winged it. Just nope. get to Scotland. and winged just it. Yeah, yeah. Keep going. And then I didn't like Aberdeen. So I, I just drove out of Aberdeen. And I came to a place called um, Bankery which is on D side. And I can remember peering over the bridge, which I was there a month ago, peering over the same bridge going, how on earth do you ever get to fish something like that? Looking into the, the river D and, uh, and that was it. So I decided that I'd stay there and I'd try and make some sort of living there. And, um, and I did, so I cleaned people's houses and I worked in nursing homes and, and um, and I kept looking over the river, thinking, how on earth do you get to go and fish somewhere like that, you know? And yeah. and, uh, and it goes on from there. But it was an old woman at that point in the nursing home, Mrs. Chidsey, that I was minding. And she said to me, Glenda, you told your parents you were going fishing for the rest of your life. Why are you still working here? <laughs> you know? And so every day when I went to clean her room and, you know, help her, she would be there and she would be, you know, whinging at me. And, you know, of course, she was trying to protect me and, you know, and, and help me. <laughs> Um, but of course, I used to think, oh, my goodness, I've got to go and clean this woman's room. And I used to try and avoid her. But she was a fantastic woman. And she kept at it and at it Brilliant. until eventually I got fishing for Scotland on the Scottish team. And she, I'd come back. She goes, no, look what you have, you know. And um, and it went from there. So I set up my first business in Scotland called To Cast a Fly. I did my first cast and teaching qualifications in Scotland run by Sana. And um, and. And I started my little business. I still nursed and stuff and did what I had to do to pay the rent. But that was when I first really got started teaching fly fishing. So it's over 30 years um, that I've been on this road. And not an easy road, a fairly rocky road at times, but um, but on this road of teaching people how to improve their casting. And, um, and I've had so much pleasure out of it, you know, from when I look back to those really early days. My first qualification, I think, was 18 years old, something like that, with Sana. Um, and I did their, their at that time it was called trout and salmon, now it's single handed and double handed because of course we well know that we can use a single handed rod for a lot more than trout fishing. Yes. And um, I'm glad we you can said use a double handed rod for a lot more than salmon fishing. You know, so but back in those days it was it was um you know, trout trout fishing and salmon fishing. Yeah. And um and then when I came back to Ireland in nineteen ninety seven, um I came back and I then um Oh, I did many things at that time, Kerry, because in the fishing industry, especially when you come back to Northern Ireland, and the troubles were very high at that time up there, yeah. um, you needed to do lots of different things to try and make some sort of living out of it. So I was a, a sales rep for guide fly fishing at the time. And um, and I was here at the time we were trying to introduce one of the first spay lines that came on the market, which was the Rio wind cutters. So I had 17 accounts, which I was servicing around Ireland, all the way from the very north to the very, very south of Ireland. Yeah. And um, I was managing the Irish Ladies Fly Fishing Team. Again, I set up my little business called To Cast a Fly. And, um, and I was writing for a magazine. And I was writing their fishing articles for them. So I was doing loads of different things to try and make some sort of living out of, out of, what, out of it. 
But it was just such an exciting time to be in the in the, the industry, especially when those first spay lines came out. Um, and eventually I came to the South uh, to write an article and fell in love with the owner of Blackwater Lodge. Um, married, had two beautiful children. Um, unfortunately, that marriage didn't work out. And um, But I stayed at Blackwood Lodge for about 15 years. And it was a very busy place and a great introduction, you know, obviously into what it was like to run a lodge and, and everything that goes around that. And it was a mad place back in the day. And we had 40 anglers staying with us, fishing with us, 16 miles of river on the River Blackwater. And, um, and it was great, but it was very tying. Um, but during that time, yes, I got my qualifications with Abgai Ireland. And um, and again, I did the single-handed and the double-handed to the highest level that they, they have. I then went on to um, chair that that association for approximately 10 years um, until I needed a little bit of freedom, to be honest, um, to be able to set up my travel company, Kerry, and do other things that I wanted to do. I think there's a time and a place for everything in life, you know. Because I noticed, are you the MD of the Blackwater Fishery? Yeah. So Blackwater Salmon Fishery, um, when Blackwater Lodge and Salmon Fishery, when they, um, when when it all um, stopped operating, um, what happened at that point was I took on some of their their stretches of the river and set up Blackwater Salmon Fishery, um, which is, I mean, it's a it's not a continuation. It's just a different model um, as to what we were doing. You see, with having the lodge, and um, at that time we had 20 team members working in-house, we had 10 guides um, and gillies on the river. Um, it was so tying, because of course you know what it's like, I mean, if you're running something like that, um, there's there's always somebody who does, doesn't turn up for work, so you're filling in that slot and you're managing people all the time. So I wanted a bit of freedom. Is that, is that a, freedom, a certain stretch, or is it the all? Because it's quite a long river, isn't it? It's a long river. It's one of the longest rivers in the country, in fact. So what I have is um, I downsized everything from 16 miles to 1.3 miles. So I've kept my home base here in Ireland. And um, and when I'm away, I mean, Nick, Noel, my partner um, in life and business, Noel Fitzmaurice. So he, um, in fact, he's my fiance. We got engaged last year after oh, 11 years of being together. Thank you. Um, so he, ha- he has traveled with me quite a bit, but, you know, he stays here at home manages the fishery while I'm not away as well and um, and it's, it works perfectly because we downsized we kept obviously one of the, the best beats on the river um, for producing fish and also it's a very nice place to be it's got a lovely hut it's got its own toilet and everything and um, and it's a very very nice stretch of river to fish so Noel's in those days manages the people that come fishing there and um, you know we have tea and coffee facilities and, and licensed distributors and, and stuff so he's there whenever and gives me then the freedom to be able to take groups around the world and to see the rest of the world the way I'd always wanted to do you know so it works really really well to have our home business and also our travel business. That book really paid off for you didn't it? Yeah. You got the, you got the, um, the perfect life yeah. for a fisherman. I have a wonderful life um, Kerry I do have a wonderful life sometimes however I am my own worst enemy because I've been self-employed all my life. And what happens is that through many, many times and many tough times in this industry um, and many financially tough times in this industry, and anybody that's in the industry can obviously relate to this, that what happens is that you you never really know what's going to happen next. So you work really hard, you know, and you need to work really hard because you don't know what's going to happen. And um, so I, I'm in total control of my diary. And um, and that sounds like a really great thing, but sometimes it's a bad thing because, yes, I know that sometimes I'm a workaholic and my to-do lists are really, really long. If And if I'm not, if I have a few gaps, I'll always fill it with something else. Yeah. So like you and this podcast, during the pandemic, when we're sitting at home for the first time that I actually had any time off since I was 14 years old was the pandemic. And I'm not I'm being absolutely serious about this. I didn't. I had run, you know, grown up two children through all of this. Uh, my ex-husband had suffered from cancer for many, many years. So there have been lots of, you know, stuff going on to keep to keep to keep us occupied. And then the pandemic came. And I remember Noel, I sitting outside the front of this this house where we live today. And of course, everything was grounded. All of the trips that I'd organized that year, all, of course, like a set of dominoes, just collapsed. And after the, the aftermath of trying to f- you know, fix all of that and sort it all out. And I was sitting here and I thought, wow, I actually 
don't know what to do with myself, you know. And and um, listen to Kelly's podcast. Said, well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I thought I'm not really quite sure what what's going to happen here next. I don't even know if we're still going to be in business by the end yeah. of this. And um, and it was one of those really surreal times because, you know, obviously it was frightening for everyone. Um, worried about or you know older parents and and like everyone was but at that point Noel said something to me and he says Glenda when we start again what would you change you know and at that point we had many more beats in the black water and I thought oh I would downsize he goes well let's do it I said I would travel more <laughs> and he goes well let's do it and I said and I would like to write again because I one of the most important times of my life was when I was writing because when I was writing and selling, I was traveling around the country of Ireland and I was meeting all of these wonderful people who had wonderful stories. And and I just loved to write about them. Yeah. And he goes, well, why don't you yeah, why yeah. Don't you start writing, writing again? I thought, well, where are we going to find the time to do that? He goes, well, make the time. I thought, okay. So like you, Kerry, we set up something. It's called Fish Live Learn with Glenda Powell because we know fishing is not just about fishing. We know fishing is a lot more about learning from other people that we meet, you know, out, you know, wherever we are. It's not people learning from me. It's me learning from them and then trying to harness what they know and get it on video, et cetera. So we, we have this online newsletter, which we um, which we put out every month. So some of it's video work. Some of it is written work. And because it's not just about fishing, um, we have five parts to do with fishing. One part is to do with food because I love to eat. I love to experience different types of food when I'm traveling. And the other part is some form of adventure, whether it's, you know, a walk or whether it's a bit of canoeing or or something just different. And um, Is this so linked on this. your website then to yeah, people to find this? It, yeah, it is, yeah. So it's called Fish Live Learn with Glenda Powell. So we put this out every month, but it's now developed into, you know, doing lots of Zoom meetings with the people. Um, you know, the members come along to different events that we're holding. And uh, and it's just a great way to get to meet people. But one of the most special things for me, um, and it's not, you know, yes, it makes a few pounds as part of an overall income. But the most special thing for me, Kerry, is this. You know, the old boatmen that we meet and the old people that we meet um, that when we're out there and they have so many stories. Oh, and it's, go it's the, gold. The being, it's gold, yeah, isn't it? It is gold. So like what you do, I try to get those people to, and eventually they'll, they'll, they'll decide, yes, yes, I'll go on video. And we'll get somebody on video that tells a story about the lake or the river that they fished and the different, you know, how things have changed during their lifetime. And because a lot of these, a lot of these older people, sometimes their families don't fish. And when, when you're an angler talking to another angler, yeah. what happens is that you know the questions to ask. Yeah. So, of course, I can ask these people the questions and, you know, get get their answers. And, you know, we've met people who, you know, tells us about the famine times and they can show us the lazy beds where they used to make, you know, grow the potatoes. Things that you wouldn't recognize if you're just walking across a field with a few humps in it. Yeah. But they remember the time when their fathers and grandfathers told them different stories. And, and so you get this on camera. And the one thing I love more than ever is that, that you know, one one day, none of us will be here, but, you know, one day those people won't be here either. And we can give this recording, which is on camera, to um, to their families. And they can really learn what their, you know, what their father or grandfather knew about. And, you know, because quite often we interview people that, you know, are in the business, that we all know who they are. And But I like to give the people who are not in the business who people don't really know who they are and have never really had their stories told. And that is what Fish Live Learn to me is all about as well. I got a similar story to that. There's, um, there was a sea trout legend. He was a god in Wales, you can say for sea trout, John Graham. And yes. uh, I interviewed him. I did two episodes of the podcast uh, 12 months ago. And they were just the best I've ever done. Uh, he, he was just, as I said, he was gold. And the things he was talking about and Sadly, then, in August, he passed away, but it's yeah. there now, you know, and no one can yes. take it away. Like, I thoroughly enjoyed chatting, and he was saying that you loved stories, you know, and telling stories. But when I'm traveling around, especially in the West, I find, you're meeting these people. Like, for instance, I was in Loch Nafui at the end of last year, and I was driving down this road, and I helped to chat with this guy, and he was a proper character. 
And I was just sitting in the van talking to him. And you could tell he doesn't talk to many people. And you know what? I wish I recorded it. The the things he was coming out with. And I thought, when I come over now, I'm coming out in May for a a couple of months. And not just the the podcast for the fishermen. I love the thought. And he was saying, talking about the famine. You know, listen to people talking about cooling just by Clombeur there. It's you've you've got to record it and I love the photography to go with it. So that's one of my yeah. goals. If you're enjoying this podcast, consider becoming a Patreon. You get weekly podcasts from the biggest names in the sport, access to over 165 episodes, behind the scenes photography, and other exclusive content. From just five pounds a month. To tune in, visit patreon.com forward slash casting with Kerry Jones. I'll see the link on my website, castingwithkerryjones.com. As I looked on your website, uh, and it's Glenda Powell Guiding, if I remember right, is yes. it? Is this part Glenda- of it? Because I didn't see this, yeah. this Fish yeah. Live so, Learn. Okay, so there's, Glen- yeah, there's Glenda Powell Guiding, thank you. Um, we have Blackwater Salmon Fishery, and there's another page, which is Glenda Powell Fishing. So it's right. www.glendapowellfishing.com. So that's on that. And- yeah, and the fish live learn is on that. Right. And um, and but I mean, if people Google Glenda Powell and they can send me an email and I can send them a link and I can also send them, of course, um, you know, a piece that we've done to see whether they'd like to subscribe to it or not. Yeah. It's thirty six euro a year to subscribe to this. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, yeah I think it's good value, and um, and like that too with the zooms and stuff that we do. Um, and one of the zooms, the first one of the first zooms we did was why do we go fishing, and it was just amazing to have different people on giving their 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 talk about why they they go fishing, and and we all think it's for you know it's lots of different reasons why people go fishing, and I've just written a, a small piece and put it out that you know often people think it's the tug is the drug, but for me it's that whole being out of control because I am in control a lot in my office and what I'm doing and, you know, planning my diary. But when you're head off to go somewhere fishing, you're actually out of control. You're the, you're the, you can't change the weather. You, um, you can't make a fish jump on the end of your line. And I think that's freedom to me. Um, and to be able to go out there and, and just not know what's going to happen next. And your mind is, is immersed refreshing. in just yes. the fishing. You don't even, nothing comes into your head. Apart from how to also, catch a fish. Yeah, I, and I also hear people, Kerry, talking about, you know, going fishing to escape life. I I actually think it's the other way around. I think we go fishing to get to life. Yeah, that's you good. Know, yeah. I think there's an awful lot of there's an awful lot of this life that we live in today, um, that is not real life, you know. And you go back a hundred years, this wasn't real life. We didn't have computers and everything else that's around us today. You know, so being out in nature you know, grounding ourselves again with the seasons, knowing which season it is. Um, yeah. I think it's so important and and so so good for mental health as well as as well as everything else. And it is one thing that I have found when I'm on the banks of the river that yes, I am a castle instructor or fly fishing instructor, but I don't really think that's my real job. Um I think my real job is to try and help people to enjoy themselves a little bit more when they're out there because when you're out in the bank of a river and people quieten enough. They tell you things and they tell you things which are upsetting them or harmful to them or hurting them in their lives. And, you know, just to have someone to listen to when they're out there and and somebody who's, you know, lived um, as I have done the way I have and experienced many different um, aspects of life. It's nice to just have a stranger listen for a while. And I think that that is one of the, the keys of what I do. Um, you mention rivers a lot, and it's obviously you're known for your salmon fishing. Mm-hmm. Do you actually fish any lochs at all? Have we done any lock style fishing? Yeah, I did. Um, I did uh, quite a lot. Whenever I was in the Scottish team, it was all lock style fishing. Things have changed a lot in the locks today as far as the techniques, but I love going out on the locks fishing. I just don't get as much time as I'd like to to be able to go out more. I absolutely adore being in a boat. Now, I, honestly, I'd never go out in a boat without a, a, a boat person because that would just be like foolish because I'm not a boat person. And um, and I need the experience of someone to take me out, especially the Irish locks where it's wild. Um, so I always go out with a boat person or and they're, they, who know the water, who know which flies are you know, potentially going to work, who know the places in the lock. 
So, and I would say that to anybody that's dabbling in boat fishing to make sure that you have a boatman or a boat person to take you out because um, it's just it's just too dangerous otherwise. And um, and you won't get the satisfaction out of it because these guys know exactly where to take you on the lake and girls. And um, and they they also are able to help you with fly selection. And um, and if most of us don't have that much time off anymore, you know. So if I have a couple of days where I'm going to, you know, go to Lock Corrib or Lock Mask, I'm always going to find somebody that's reputable in the business. You know, hire them for a few days. And that just makes my life a lot more pleasant and my days off a lot more pleasant. So I definitely recommend that. But I love, I absolutely adore lock fishing. And I love small locks as well. And especially the hill locks. And one of the locks I fished in Donegal, I can't remember the name of it. I was about 19, 20 and I just got back from Scotland. And I was thinking I was one of the first people ever to have one of the, those float tubes, which are nothing like what they are today. Today, they're um, they're very sophisticated float tubes. But I remember getting this float tube whenever I was working for guide fly fishing. And a girlfriend and myself, we um, we took it up to one of the hill locks in, Don in Donegal. And I remember with a tent and midges everywhere eating us alive. I was out there in the float tube floating around um, oh. and, uh, and, and fishing for trout. It was just like wonderful. Now, the problem that I had was I was, you know, one of, I was very young in my swimming costume and with my flippers. And I was out in the middle of the lock and I'll never forget this feeling of, I wonder, does this lock have pike? I thought, oh my goodness, I can remember <laughs> flipping back so fast, you know, put my waders on and then went back out feeling much more comfortable. You know? I've <laughs> done I've done it a few times actually, and it's not easy, is it? Because you can only go no. backwards, you, you know, because yes. of the way you sit in the flippers and that, but no, yes. I can imagine if there's pike in there. It was a great experience. So I've always loved locks. And actually when I was a kid, um, lock cooey, which was um, a rainbow trout stocked fishery, um, in near a place called Port Ferry, it was up and running and one of the the biggest um, hives of activity at that time. And I remember there was lots and lots of competitions being run at that point. And my job was to manage the 16 boats and put people out on it just before I went to Scotland. And um, and that was a great, that was great. And, you know, all of the, the older flies, like the Ace of Spades we were using, and, yeah. you know, the, and boobies were, boobies were just about coming out. And, you know, but I remember coming back from Scotland, you know, we were fishing, you know, buzzers and criminoid midge. I was wondering why they weren't doing it here in Ireland. Of course, now they do. And, um, but it's just techniques have changed a lot. And, um, and that's exciting too, because it keeps us all thinking and keeps all on our toes. It's dry yeah, is more than wet these fish. days, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. And the buzzers are taking off. I love it. Yeah. yeah. We actually share yeah. a same friend as well. And every time I see him, he's shared a boat with me a few times on Corrib. It's Jimmy Turrell. Oh, he's a wonderful person. He is, yeah. He's a Welshman, see? Absolutely. Well, he's, he? well, he's an adopted yeah, Irishman, I think, actually. <laughs> yeah, I think he is at this stage, yeah. No, he's actually he's actually tied a lot of flies for us um, as, as part of our Fish Live Learn um, content as well. He's a great fly tire, but he's just a beautiful person. Yeah, yeah. And um, and we're running a course together, actually, on the Blackwater. It's a wet fly fishing um, for trout course. Um, it's full, but as as it always is, whenever Jimmy is, is involved in something, so it's a fully booked course. I think it's um, in April, and um, so he's coming down to the Blackwater to help me run a course. And I like doing that as well, you see, because you know he's just so knowledgeable. And again, like that, he doesn't really realise how knowledgeable he actually is. Yeah. So I will always sit in and help with these courses so that I can, you know, drag the information out of of Jimmy, you know, as a as a, a customer, so to speak, would would do, and ask all of those stupid questions, even though I might know the answers to them, but you know, just to make sure that he, you know, that we all get, you know, what he's what he's trying to say. Yeah. So he's just an amazing, amazing guy, and I love his flies. And he, he ta I don't know if we've been in his. Um a shed. Mm. He's got a shed in the yes. garden where he's kitted yeah. out for his fly tying. Two other people which I've chatted with recently as well on the on the podcast is Dan O'Neill and Stevie Munn. Yeah, again, two great friends. Um, I've known Stevie for such a long time. He's um, he's we grew up in a similar area um, in Northern Ireland, and um, I probably met him about thirty years ago when we were first on the on the show circuit. You know, the um, in, I think Schoon Palace. Um, over in Scotland is where we first met, but um, but yeah, and Dan O'Neill is, is lovely, lovely, um, lovely young man, very very involved in in his fishing. And you've all got and, something um, in common with uh, Cadence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. 
we do. So, so a few years ago, I was I've worked for numerous different fly fishing companies over the years, and um, and like that, I mean, it's 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 one of those things. It's it's a part of what I do. So I have about five or six different parts of what I do that make up um, tuition, I suppose, and and my hosted trips and the Blackwater has always been my my staples. But every now and again, I take on something else um, out of enjoyment more than anything else. Um, so whenever Cadence was um, deciding that they were going to set up their fly fishing section, I was asked, would I would I like to join in? So I did. Um, and I did because of the people that was involved in working in it. So two very good people that I know uh, in the industry. One was um, Ian Gordon, um, another one, James Robbins, who I'd also worked with when I worked with with um, Pure Fishing. And, um, and of course, Stevie. And and Ian and Stevie had been designing rods for a very, very long time. My job would be to test rods and um, see if, you know, test lines on them and see what see what, what I liked and um, and give some feedback on it. And so I've been there from the very, very early days. And um, and then, you know, Dan O'Neill and other people have been coming in as well, which has been fantastic because we need that, you know, young energy um, in Cadence and, um, and again, to diversifying into different aspects of of different techniques with single handed, double handed, um micro spay rods, etc. So very much involved in development and very much involved in um in trying to get the message across that 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 one of our biggest things about Cadence is that it's about go fish and give back. So there's a portion of whatever we earn that that goes back into the fishing industry to be able to help others learn how to fish. And I think that is so important today. And I've got to that lovely age of my life where, where I'm very comfortable about what I do. And, um, and thankfully, business is, is, is going well um, at the moment. And, um, and just to give that little bit of time back to try and help other people. And so all of us that's involved in Cadence today is, has the same kind of ethics and, um, and just that, that whole thing about being able to to help people. So I love to um, host the Cadence Days here in Ireland and overseas. And that's really about bringing people together, you know, as a community, more than, you know, coming to have a look at Cadence, but also teaching them, you know, dur during those days and helping them to match lines to their own rods or to be able to, you know, have a feel of something which might be a little bit different, not necessarily to try and sell them something, um, but and to me, it's one of the greatest problems that we have in the industry is you can get a very good rod and a very good reel, but if you don't have a line to match, then it just doesn't work for the person. And everybody's different, Kerry, in that we're all built differently, different sizes, different heights, different arm lengths. So sometimes a line will suit somebody, you know, and sometimes a line just simply won't suit someone. So I'm very involved with their line developments and hopefully get on to, you know, to take on their skagits and stuff like that for them as well, just to have some shorter headed lines in, you know, you know, for cadence. And so very, very excited. Great bunch of people to work with. And um, and yeah, I can see cadence growing um, in the future. I've got a few notes in front of me. We could go on and on and on. But there's there's a couple of more questions I want to ask. Perhaps we can have another chat another time. And in fact, when I'm over, perhaps you can join me. I'll take you out on the uh, on the corrib on my boat. That would we, be lovely. We could do a, another chat live off the boat then. That would but be great. Have you got any goals for this season? Yeah, so this season um, I'm heading to Iceland and I'm going up there. I've been to Iceland um, every year now for a number of years. And I started to spend a little bit of um, extended time in Iceland. Um, so this year I'm going up for two months to Iceland. Wow. And um, I'm going up there to do a number of things. And one of them is to work with um, what, the River Blunda, which is operated by Stara Fishing. And um, and I find that in the last number of years, there's been, you know, a, a quite a large group of Icelandic people who just want to upskill their casting. So a lot of these people are not beginners or they're people that just want to get better um, at fishing. And they seem to like the style that I'm using. So I'm going back up to help them. Another thing is that um, that what I've, what I've discovered is that quite a, quite often people will go on a fishing trip and it might only be a three day trip, and it's very hard to get somebody going in three days if they're a complete beginner. So I'm going up to help a few younger guides um, 
teach people how to teach in a really, you know, in a really quick way. So we're going to, it's a bit of train the trainer is the easiest way to say it. So I'm going to have to teach some young guides how to teach quickly and to get the message across to somebody who just has three days fishing. What do they need to know? And how can, how can we get the, these people to do it so they can enjoy their fishing better? Um, and then, of course, we have our own hosted trips going up um, to Iceland. And um, I'll be working with Ian Gordon as well um, on his hosted trips and then staying there for an extra three or four weeks to guide at Blunder Lodge. So that's um, that's what I'm really, you know, it's the first time of doing that length of time in Iceland. So that was a goal and it's something which is happening this season for me. One of the reasons why I really want to go to the River Blunda, apart from the fact that it is a beautiful lodge, um, I want to go there because Blunda means blend and um, and they have the blend of fish in that one river. OK, so they have a magnificent Atlantic salmon, which is very, very well known for. Um, they don't really fish it that often for brown trout, which they have spectacular brown trout fishing in it. Um, they have Arctic char and they also have um, sea trout. So for me, I want to these I, I've set up a few trips um, this June and there's three day trips and uh, and people are coming up to fish for those different species. So it's two sessions um, fishing for Atlantic salmon and four sessions then fishing for arty char, brown trout and sea trout on the rest of the river. Now we have about 40 kilometres of water. Um, for nine people and it's just you know that's that excites me because of course you have all different methods you know so we're going to be obviously fishing for Atlantic salmon with all of the different methods of doing that we'll be hitching flies we'll be you know we'll be swinging flies we'll be stripping flies and then of course when we go to the trout and the char we're going to be dry droppering we're going to be nymphing for them we're going to be swinging um and we're going to be streamer fishing for them so it's just a whole it's just a fantastic thing to be able to you know, mix all those methods together. Is this on um, the west then? Yeah, it is northwest. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's where the charm mostly mainly you're from, if I yeah. remember right. Yeah. Just wonderful place yeah. in the middle of nowhere. I think there's only one roundabout um, in the in the whole area, <laughs> you know, which is so easy. And um, and yeah, so I'm really looking forward to that. Really looking forward to, to going to do that. It sounds brilliant. Yeah. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed our chat. Now, now there's there's one more question. I want to ask you, which I ask everyone at the end, where would you want to be to make your last cast? Mm, that is an interesting question. And I have thought a little bit about this. And um, and as much as I love the Patagonians and I love the Greenlands and the Icelands and everywhere else that I go to, I love the Blackwater very much. and It's been my home for almost 30 years. Um, however, when I was a kid and when we were going fishing, my father didn't fish. And I was in the little river Inler, which runs from Strang runs from Belfast into Strangford Lock, a tiny little river. And we'd be fishing around shopping trolleys. And, you know, it was very difficult to catch trout um, at that time in that little river. But I do remember going fishing on the 1st of March was the opening day of the season. And off we go down to the river and there were no phones and no mobile phones. And my father, um, who's passed away 15 years almost, he would get up in the morning. We, 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 would have, we would have all been gone as a group, you know, of, of kids taking the day off school um, to go down the river to, to try and catch trout. And he would walk that river um, and he'd find us and he'd have this huge bag filled with soda farls, with egg and bacon, all wrapped in tin foil. And each person would have this little parcel and he would give it, give us this parcel, and he'd just walk the riverbank until he found us all. You know, <laughs> and wow. so if I had one day left to go fishing, I would love to go back to the inn there. I'd love to be with my sisters, and my friends, and I'd love that my father would appear with the soda pearls. Many thanks, Glenda. Okay, thank you. Take care. If you've enjoyed this podcast and want to listen to more, please consider becoming a patron. We will get weekly podcasts and access to over 165 episodes behind the scenes photography to go with each episode plus other exclusive content and prizes to become a patreon visit patreon.com forward slash casting with kerry jones or you can find the link on my website casting with kerry jones.com that's all for now and tight lines and may they always be up in the wave <laughs>